Diane Ravitch, author of Left Back, A Century of Failed School Reforms. Are there, are there, uh, I know I want to, want to use the word norms, but I'm looking for, are there cliches about schools that, that are true and some that aren't true? When you just, you know, there, are there givens? Well, what kinds of schools? I mean, any school, any school. We, we, you know, we talk about this, the edu in politics right now, there's a lot of talk about education, a lot of statements are made. What do you agree with and disagree with? Well, I mean, the first thing that one would say as a generality is that there's a broad range of schools today, and there have been in the past. Uh, we have schools in this country, public schools, that are absolutely spectacular, uh, where kids get a first-rate education, and we have some that are awful schools, and there's a huge range in between. So the first generality is to be aware of generalities. What's in your book? What's the purpose? Well, the purpose of this book is it's a history of the 20th century. And it's a narrative, uh, and I've tried to document it and show the evidence as best I can uh, to show how our, our philosophy of education became what it is. Uh, and we don't, as Americans, tend to think we're philosophical, and we tend to think we don't have a philosophy. We, ju we just do what works. Uh, but what I try to show in this book is that over 100 years, there has been a philosophy at work. Uh, it's a philosophy that, in most cases, parents are not in sync with, and even teachers are not in sync with, uh, and it's been a raining down of theory, and in many cases, bad theory, on the schools, so that it's 100 years of arguing about who should be taught, and what should they be taught, and uh, how, how we should run schools. And I guess one purpose was to show um, that the kinds of debates we're having to today didn't come from nowhere, there's a history. And so that's the story I've been trying to tell. Who's the most important writer in history or philosopher in history about education from your standpoint? Well, I would say that far and wide it's John Dewey. Uh, Don, John Dewey was very, very important, had a huge influence, uh, both for good and for ill. What was good about his philosophy? Well, I would say that the, the good, and I, I can't define his philosophy in general because he, I have, a, I think, two shelves at home filled with Dewey's books, and I won't pretend to have read them all, but I read his educational work. He's very sensitive to children. Uh, he, I think, uh, makes people aware that how children learn is very important, that their motivation is very important, and that their interest level is also very important. That it was a very positive contribution that Dewey made. Uh, the negative side is that he fuzz things up an awful lot. Uh, he tended to uh, make statements that interest was more important than effort, and his followers took this to mean that effort wasn't important at all, that interest was the only thing that counted. And a lot of, of uh, to my mind, unsuccessful education movements uh, came about because of people uh, either misreading D Dewey or sometimes reading him accurately but picking out the parts of Dewey that uh, led them to say, let's throw away curriculum, let's throw away subject matter, let's let kids do what they want to do, uh, or in some cases, uh, let's meet the needs of society, uh, thinking that they were following Dewey and uh, tracking kids relentlessly. Th this may not work, but if John Dewey was alive today. Which of the presidential candidates would have him as their chief advisor on education? Uh, neither one. Uh, Dewey was a socialist, and I suspect he would be very unhappy with both candidates. As a socialist, what would he stand for versus what they stand for? Well, I would say that on the whole, Dewey primarily stood for the child-centered school, uh, the idea that you try to find whatever is interesting in the moment and uh, build on that to, to take the child up to higher levels of understanding. Uh, I think that we can all learn from reading, for instance, about the school that Dewey himself ran. And whereas the cliche is that uh, he was the great uh, exponent of a child-centered schooling where there was no subject matter, in fact, in the Dewey School, which uh, he started at, at the end of the 19th century, uh, children were uh, learning about history. They were learning about uh, the explorations of, of the Americas. They were learning wonderful history and literature. Uh, but his teachers sat together every day and talked about how can we make this engaging? How can we take the traditional subject matter and make it exciting and lively for the children? Um, I think that would be, that, that's an exciting kind of education. Um, unfortunately, the way it tended to get translated in public schools was um, uh, let's track kids and uh, let's have some kids get the really good academic stuff and others don't need subject matter at all because uh, subject matter is not very important. When did John Dewey live? Uh, Dewey died, I think it was in uh, 1948. He was born in 1859. He had a very long life. Uh, he uh, uh, 
live to see lots and lots of changes. Uh, but I think his educational philosophy was consistent, and he was a very, very large influence. Where did he live? Uh, he was born in Vermont. Uh, he uh, taught in Michigan, University of Chicago, and Columbia, and lived most of his life in New York City. And if we found him in a debate with somebody who would be directly opposite, opposed to what he had to say back during that time, who would it be? Uh, I'd say it would be uh, probably William Torrey Harris, and I write a fair amount about Harris. Harris was Commissioner of Education, and he believed that subject matter was very important, that it, the different major subject matter, and by that I mean like history and literature and mathematics and science, language, that all of these represented very concrete, important forms of human experience, and that it was the job of the school to expose all children to these subject matters. Uh, and Harris was also a great reformer in his time. He introduced the kindergarten when he was superintendent of schools in St. Louis. Um, but he was mainly a, a strong proponent of a liberal education for all children. You went to school where? Houston, Texas. Your original elementary school level? Oh, I went all the way through public schools in Houston. Um, Montrose Elementary School, Sutton Elementary School, Albert Sidney Johnson Junior High, San Jacinto High School. Um, I don't think any of those schools still exist anymore in Houston. What do you remember about your Houston education? Um, there was, uh, um, I had some wonderful teachers. I had some terrible teachers. Um, that's, it, we, we also had racially segregated schools. Uh, the high school was strongly tracked. Uh, the kids who, some kids like me, were uh, put into the college track. Uh, others, the majority, were tracked into vocational programs or what they called at that time distributive education where they were sent off to work for half the day. And a decision was made, um, as I show in this book, a decision was made pretty early on about which kids were going to be college bound and which were not. How was it decided that you were going to be college bound? Oh, I'm sure there were tests. They gave us all kinds of tests and uh, IQ test, aptitude test. There was a lot of testing uh, to track kids. Uh, what I found in my book was that um, the, the, these were all progressive movements. I mean, the, the great discovery for me as I was doing this research, and I should say that I've been writing history of education now for 30 years. Uh, and what I tried to do here was to bring together a lot of uh, work that I've done to say, I want to step back and look at the 20th century and see how, what light it sheds on what we know today and what we're debating today. Uh, but what I found was that we've had a series of reform movements. And the first great reform movement uh, at the beginning of the century, this, uh, the 20th century, was industrial education. And the idea of the industrial education movement was let's make schooling prepare kids for work. Uh, but not everybody needed to be prepared for work, and so they selected kids out. The children of immigrants, the children of farmers, the children of industrial workers would be slated for a, that kind of work. And then along comes the IQ testing movement. This, it turns out, the guys who developed the IQ test were progressive reformers. They wanted education to be scientific. After all, Dewey had said that, uh, that education should meet the needs of society, that it should be scientific, and here they had the IQ test, which they thought would sort kids early and decide who would go into the college-bound track. So when I was in high school in the 1950s in Houston, Texas, uh, I was actually living the legacy of this history uh, that I just wrote because, in fact, the schools were using the test to identify kids early on uh, and to select those that would be college material. And the majority, uh, they believed, were not college material, and the majority were sent off into different vocational kinds of programs. Did you have an IQ test? Absolutely. Did you ever know what your IQ is? No, they didn't disclose. At the time I was in school, they never disclosed to us uh, what our tests were. In fact, I went to school at a time where we weren't even told what our SAT scores were. That was considered confidential. What I What is the IQ? Uh, the IQ test is an, it's an aptitude test. And the distinction between IQ test and achievement test is, is this. IQ is a predictor, and an achievement test tests what you've learned. And I find myself thinking achievement tests are pretty good because uh, if you've studied and you'll do well on the test, and that's fair because if everyone has a chance to learn the same material and then be tested on it, you can, with, with effort, you can do well. With the IQ test, it's a test of can you solve problems, can you uh, figure out puzzles, 
uh, you know, the analogy between these words and these words. The SAT is based on the IQ, or at least the verbal part of the SAT is a, a, a quasi-intelligence test. And it's a test of capacity and not, it's not supposed to be a test of what you've learned. 